the Ninth Command. I'm Stacy Klein, founding director of Double Edge Theater, and I have the honor to introduce the next segment of our feature, Number Seven, Indigenous playwright, theater maker, and storyteller. The series is led by the Okotoro Cultural Center and curated by one of its directors, Rhonda Anderson, in partnership with Okotoro. The Okoteo Cultural Center was founded as an autonomous indigenous space and is the first of its kind since colonization in Western and Central Nets. It is a much needed multicultural, multi-tribal space for traditional life in the environment and on the traditional lands of the Nipmuc and other tribal nations, living or from this land. The Okoteo space was donated by Double Edge in recognition of its historical and present day denial of native sovereignty on this land and the present need to redress this erasure. As Okoteo, which means to plant, to grow in the Nipmuc language, fulfilled the truth of its name and grew beyond all expectations, Double Edge also entered into a land share agreement of our 100 acres in our rural town and traditional practice as return to the land after over 500 years. I say all this to share that action is possible. There's an echo. <laughs> well, it should be repeated more than that. <laughs> This joy of remake creation and cultural life and presence is palpable and brings meaning to the land, the people of Double Edge, and the community. However, at the same time, we live in a fragile and violent world, and joy cannot exist in a vacuum. The millennia old story of the Native people and their continued presence must be shared in order to name truth and commitment to decolonization. Therefore, Okiteo's founders and directors, Rhonda Anderson and Larry Cottage Crowman, have generously agreed to share beyond their own people this educational series so that our communities can learn about this long, unacknowledged history. This series is a place where the voices of Okiteo and Native people are determinant and have the final word on their own identity. The Living Present Series 1 through 6 has covered a wide range of topics, including Native presence today and that relationship to their millennia-long history. Logos, mascots, imagery, and cultural appropriation. Land back movements and land dusting have been discussed alongside the complexities and effects of genocide, resettlement, and the imprint of continued racist stereotyping on today's lives. Living Presence has addressed the importance of Indigenous Peoples Day to those whose lives we continue to benefit from, rather than a framing of those responsible for violence and colonialization. Indigenous art and social change included artists from this region and around the continent who presented their work and discussed and shared how they use their art for justice and force. One panelist calls this a revolution of the heart. The Living Presence series is a call for truth. It's a call for action, to look history in the face and see how we can heal the bleeding wounds ask for a commitment not only to listen and understand the story of these many peoples, but also to share responsibility for that story to live fully in the present, and to make sure that erasure and disappearance gives way to reparation, decolonization of our minds and our actions, sharing land, cultural space, and most of all, justice. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank CalRound for broadcasting, the Mass Cultural Council and local cultural councils, and particularly the sponsors of the Living Presence series, Jacob's Pillow and the Mass Foundation for the Humanities Expanding Stories program. The Okiteo team includes uh, Tom Bearheart Games, 
Tracy Lo Loving Medicine Eyes Ramos, Samantha Sylvester, Nazario Tall Hair Red Deer Garate, um, a youth resident, um, and one of the founding group, um, Jasmine Oshaldudsky. And now to introduce the co founders and directors of OBK. Rhonda Anderson is a newbie at, at a bastion from Tuxtobin. Her life work is most importantly as a mother, a classically trained herbalist, silversmith, and activist. And she curated bio vibrant, visible indigenous identity through portraiture. She worked fervently as an educator activist on the removal of mascots, water protector, indigenous identity, and protecting her traditional homelands in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from extractive industry, yay. And in that light is also the curator of the Living Presence series. Rhonda tirelessly works on representation from the state house to local schools and businesses. She is on the advisory board of the New England Foundation for the Arts, was an advisor on decolonization on the past council for the arts, and most recently on philanthropy mass 52nd meeting, um, which is a lot of Rhonda's work right now is working with philanthropy to change their minds and hearts, as well as many, many panels. She is commissioner of Indian affairs in Western Mass and was named a Commonwealth heroine of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Eric Spotted Promet is a citizen of the Nipmuc Nation. He is a nationally acclaimed award-winning writer, poet, cultural educator, traditional storyteller, tribal drummer, dancer, and motivational speaker, including youth sobriety, cultural, and environmental awareness. Larry shares music, history, and culture to Nipmuc people and lectures on Native American sovereignty and identity regionally and internationally. Larry's books include Morning Road to Thanksgiving, Drumming and Dreaming, and The Whispering Basket. Larry premiered his play, Freedom in Season, in the spring of this year, and is currently making a film, Anoki, A Journey Beyond the Picture. He is on the review committee at the Native American Poets Project, an artist in residence at Bunker Hill Community College, and writing a children's book series for Indigenous youth. Larry was the first Native to have shared a traditional Nipmuc song and land acknowledgement at the opening of the Boston Marathon and recently received the first Indigenous Peoples Award presented by the NAACP. Um, before uh, we go on, I'd just like to say what a, a pleasure it is, and hopefully it's not too much our fault at Double Edge, that we're doing a playwrights um, and um, theater living presence today. Thank you um, for doing that. And um, Larry will now welcome you to the living presence of our history. <laughs> I welcome you all to Nipmuc land. I welcome you all to the series. It's an honor to be here and open up with a traditional Nipmuc welcoming song. And I want to ask uh, our other Nipmuc relatives here uh, to help me welcome you all to our traditional homelands.
Thank you so much. That was beautiful. We need to do that more often. <laughs> what? <laughs> How are you doing? Thank you for coming out today. I really appreciate that. Thank you for tuning in, for folks that are tuning in. So I said welcome and good afternoon. My name is Rhonda Anderson. I am a Anupiaq Athabascan from Alaska, and I just treated you, greeted you traditionally in my Anupiaq language. Um, I just want to take a moment again, to recognize this land and give deep appreciation for her as a living being and gratitude and acknowledgement that our collective mother provides everything that we need to survive. Tribes historically local to this area would be Sokoki, Abenaki, Pakumtuk, Nipmuc, Nanatuk, Norwatic, and Mohican tribes war, genocide, dispossession, and colonization that pressed the Nonatuk, Pakumtuk, and Norwatic tribes to seek refuge with their neighboring kin tribes and pushed the Mohican Stockbridge Munsee west in the late 1700s through 1800s to Wisconsin, where they have a reservation today in Menominee Territory. Today, the Abenaki are a state recognized tribe and Nipmuc Nation is a Massachusetts state acknowledged tribe. Please get to know the indigenous people of your area and ask what you can do to lift and raise their voices, honor and respect their sovereignty. In that spirit, as always, I have those three action items. First, recognize and make changes to the dominant narrative that glorifies colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples of this area. Please be mindful of the problematic terms like Pioneer Valley, they are a reminder of the legacy of dispossession, removal, and subsequent erasure. Second, please consider supporting the various indigenous artists that are here today. Um, please look for the forthcoming resources list after this event to inspire you to learn ways to support, lift, and center indigenous voices, narratives, and public art. And lastly, of course, there are five bills that six tribes of Massachusetts support. Please visit maindigenousagenda.org to learn more information and learn more ways to, that you can support. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you for being here today. Um, and welcome to the seventh installment. Oh my goodness, has it been seven? Seventh installment of Living Presence of Our History. This is a conversation with indigenous playwrights, theater makers, and storytellers. I am so honored to be with such an incredible panel today, especially during this time of year when indigenous people are sought after to educate others about our many cultures. We are roughly 2% of the population in the United States and 0.6% in Massachusetts. Um, so very few of us feel comfortable speaking in public. So you can imagine how busy some of us are, especially this time of year, <laughs> particularly when we are siloed into these few short weeks every year. That's when we become visible. Um, and please, you know, um, I feel like for me, this has been a little bit challenging. I, 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 I want to be upfront, like theater is not my wheelhouse, but representation is. Um, so in, in, in fact, like the few uh, experiences that I've had with theater was really growing up. And that came with those horrible elementary school, high school plays and pageants that are always done this time of year. Plays that are extremely racist, full of stereotypes and cultural appropriation. Right. So, for example, both my elementary school and high school did the play Peter Pan. Uh huh. You know, in the sign they sang that song, "What Makes the Red Man Red." Um, Annie, get your gun is another high school play that was very popular, and with the song "I'm an Indian Too." Yeah. Battle axe, hatchet piece, eagle nest. <clears throat> I'm an Indian too. Those two plays have long histories of theater, green lighting, red face, and are indoctrinated to children at an early age in public schools. 
since I was a child, there has been an increased awareness of cultural sensitivities, racial inequities, and the need for more accurate representation. So many schools, thankfully, are now omitting these problematic scenes and songs. In the past 20 years, there's been a steadily growing powerful presence of indigenous playwrights, making a mark and asserting agency over identity and representation. Indigenous theater has come a long way since Teata's theatrical storytelling and playwright Raleigh Lynn Riggs, and we still have a long way to go. I plan to cover some of the panelists' personal evolution into Indigenous theater and the need for education and the healing that theater can bring, and how, finally, to support the ongoing efforts as allies, accomplices, and co-conspirators. So if anybody has seen the living presence, I'd like to do a quick round of questions with my introductions. I'll make the introductions much briefer than usual. Um, so you may get to know our panelists, live experiences, and something maybe perhaps beyond their biography. So I'm going to start with Larissa, who is coming to us through Zoom uh, from Big Bear, California, right? Yeah. Larissa Fast Horse is from Sichangu Lakota Oyote Nation and is an award winning writer and the 2025 MacArthur Fellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a. <laughs> Her satirical comedy, The Thanksgiving Play, was one of America's top 10 most produced plays. She is the first Native American playwright in the history of American theater on that list. In spring 2023, the Thanksgiving play will make its debut on Broadway. <laughs> she is the first female Native American playwright ever produced on Broadway. Uh -huh. In 2019, Larissa re-entered film and television by co-creating a series at Freeform. And since then, she has set up projects with Disney Channel, NBC, and DreamWorks, and is writing a series for Apple Plus, um, as well as adapting three beloved Broadway musicals. So Larissa, welcome. Hi. Thank you. For Does it feel, Does it feel to be the you? first Wait, we got it? Okay, how does it feel to be the first female Native American playwright to be produced on Broadway and the first Native American to be on the top 10 list? Who, and maybe maybe you could touch on who came before you. Are you like breaking that glass ceiling for others to follow? So this, I'm sorry, this is a quick question. So maybe about two minutes. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm a Takayapi. Uh, thank you for that. That's a um, very generous introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I always say, first off, I'm so glad you mentioned Lynn Riggs, because Lynn Riggs is the first known um, Native, you know, uh, I always say known, known Native American playwright that was produced on Broadway, and he's produced a lot. He had a lot of plays on Broadway. Unfortunately, the last one was in the late 1930s. Um, although he wrote the play that um, Oklahoma, the book was based, the book of Oklahoma was based on, he was not credited, unfortunately, as a writer, even though they took the same character names and many of the lines from his, directly from his play. So I just always want to say that right away. Also, I always say I'm the first known Native American female playwright. I guarantee you we've had previous Native American playwrights on Broadway, um, but for various reasons that we all know, for safety, for um, you know, simulation policies, et cetera. Uh, they perhaps have not identified themselves that way, but um, I'm the first one that we that we know of. Um, so it's a huge honor. And yeah, it's weird, it's wild. It's, it's I'll say it's hard. It's hard being the only one. It's a very different um, world. And when I'm there, there's, um, there, there aren't other people <laughs> to talk to about it. There's no one I can go to ever to say, you know, hey, how'd you deal with this? What did you do? How, how, um, uh, did you, you know, get through this? It's, it's a very different world, the Broadway world, and um, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of things that happen that um, honestly, are, it's, it's hard. And, and having, you know, my play all over the country, I'm dealing with a lot of different folks um, all over the country right now. Thanksgiving plays in probably 15 places right now as we speak, and maybe more. 
And um, it's hard when there's nobody else, um, when you're the only one. Um, there's tons of native theater artists. There just aren't any others like in the commercial world. So I'm hoping soon that will not be the case, that I won't be the only one. And I'm excited because there's so many incredibly talented native theater artists all over this continent. And I really am excited for how many more there are gonna be. Um, by the time my play opens in Broadway, actually I have a second play I'm working on for Broadway. So by the time that one opens, I expect I won't be the only one anymore. And I'm really excited for that. Oh, so excellent. Thank you for your work. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Carolyn Dunn. Dr. Carolyn Dunn is an indigenous artist of Cherokee, Muskegee Creek and Seminole descent on her father's side and is French Canadian, African, Tanaka, Choctaw, Biloxi, Ishak on her mother's side. Her life as a storyteller encompasses both poetry and playwriting and works about and with works about family, grief, resilience and the landscape in all the genres and in between. Carolyn has published five books of poetry and two books on her plays forthcoming. Her plays, The Fry Bread Queen, Ghost Dance, and Soldad have been developed and staged at the Native Voices at the Autry. Dr. Dunn lives part-time in LA and part-time in Oklahoma with your family. Dr. Dunn, I would love to start with your poetry, like books. Like I'm a book nerd, if anybody, <laughs> like I ran out and I'm like, I'm buying books every bit. It's a problem, I have a problem. <clears throat> I have read your book of poetry, Echolocation and Coyote Speaks, uh, that you co-wrote with Ari Burke, which is just full of your beautiful poetry. Thank you. Um, you write with such fluidity and ease. When did you start writing poetry? Oh my gosh, that like Larissa said, you know, that is a very generous and loving introduction so well but thank you for that and Koke for that um halito chimichugma carolyn dunsoho uh so chapayet and um i am carolyn dunn i bring you greetings in um in the choctaw language um uh, i uh when did i start writing oh my gosh i can remember going and, and being in there and I tell this story a lot in third grade going to the paper mm -hmm. cupboard and cutting paper cupboard in half I mean cutting the paper not the cupboard but cutting the paper in half and then just writing stories mm -hmm. for my friends and so it's always um I don't remember the first poem but I know it was a long time ago mm -hmm. I know it was um at least an elementary school which mm -hmm. was a long time ago <laughs> um and so but I but I come from a family yes honey I it it was a long time ago Liliana. Uh, she's agreeing with me Liliana um so coming from a family of storytellers and um artists it was it just happened it just came to me and I just started doing it it was normal beautiful is what it is thank you <laughs> thank you um Larry well, you need no introduction. <laughs> He's been introduced already beautifully by Stacy. Um, however, some people might not know that you've done acting a few times in television and movies. You had an active role in PBS's Native American miniseries, We Shall Remain, and The First Patriots, as well as being seen in the X-Men, the new mutants that was released just a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> where everyone's like we are we we are not creatures we are not mutants <laughs> <laughs> however most recently you were also an actor in your own primarily solo performance theater piece uh freedom and season did you find acting in these distinct genres to be very different and if so like were there challenges um, thank you. Uh, once again, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, um, the Freedom in Season piece was uh, like a whole different uh, feeling, emotion, um, uh, sensation in terms of like, um, and I'll get into more of that later, in terms of like uh, talking about my ancestors through the Civil War and uh, where their land was being taken, their children being taken. So it was really like a, a, um, a possession of playing that piece. Um, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I had some fun in the X-Men uh, with Adam Beach. And, uh, you know, as an aside, you know, I, when I ran into the camera and smashed that $2,000 camera in my face, which is a really, you know, outtakes, maybe someday I'll be in bloopers. But um, uh, those instances of being in film, um, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. Um, and as you mentioned, the um, PBS, We Shall Remain, was a very powerful um, uh, piece that we got to work on, open that up, working with Chris Ear and many others. Uh, uh, developing that and uh and again doing the we shall remain we got to just be who we are uh and, and so we were kind of guiding that process and uh you know so i think uh when indigenous folks are allowed to um, guide the process and be interactive and engaging in the things that they're creating it really uh gets we get so, so much better results on who and what we want to share so thank you beautiful well said thank you um rebecca Welcome. Rebecca Podleski is a Anishinaabekwe, an Ojibwe woman, and a member of Zibasing, First Nation on Manitoulin Island, Ontario. She is a mother, a wife, a teacher, an actress, and a playwright. Rebecca is the chair of the Sugar Island Powwow Committee and been a member for 17 years and works for the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians Early Head Start Program. Rebecca has been with Anishinaabe Theater Exchange since the beginning and is a playwright for the play 50 Cents a Pound, a play about native fishing rights, and Reflections, which is a play about murdered and missing indigenous women and the underground sex trade. Rebecca believes being able to tell stories of her people the ancestors, the struggles, and the trauma speaks to the perseverance as a people and as a culture. Rebecca, who are your mentors in this work? What inspires you to write plays? Mm, mm, that's a good and question. A tough question. Um, <clears throat> no, miigwech, miigwech for that introduction. Um, being with my uh, ATE aunties, the, the anti squad, uh, Colleen Madison and uh, Tamantha Sylvester, Carolyn Dunn, um, Miguela, uh, Iron Shell, Domingo. Yes, yes. Um, we've all we've all had traumas in our life, um, whether it be a trauma that you have personally experienced, or a blood memory trauma. Um, Having those, th those chances to write those plays allows me to heal from everything that I've been through personally. And I feel that it's something that gives our people the chance to have that voice being heard because we've been silenced for so long uh, that we, we now have that opportunity and bringing using theater to bring real world issues to the stage so that we can we can speak and we will be silenced no more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Powerful. Oh, Jasmine. Jasmine, Michelle, good speed. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you for coming. Jasmine is a member of the Nipmuc Nation and is a Massachusetts-based actor, singer-songwriter, playwright, and director. Prior to the pandemic, she produced Free Shakespeare in the Look Park, which is uh, a local park, uh, for five years under the name, and I love this, Billy Shakespeare Shakespeare. <laughs> 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 Jasmine has written, produced, and acted in a musical about her tribe titled 1675 and told the story of King Philip's War and the tragedy of Deer Island, which was performed at UMass Amherst to full houses each night in 2018. Yeah, Jasmine, um, you were recently invited to the First Nations Native Performing Arts Convening in Portland, Oregon. Mm, that must have been amazing. Can you speak a little bit about how you may have felt and perhaps inspired to be at that convening? Uh, for that introduction. And um, yeah, it was 
it's just amazing being around so many other Native people and Native artists and hearing their experience with their art. Um, there were a lot of sound artists there, which I thought was really, really interesting um, and got to uh, just go to the performances, a lot of them sound-based and um, one that stuck out to me um, deeply was one where we were walking through this space and just experiencing these these sounds, these speakers all around us. And they were just like, just move, just, and it was very different than, you know, your traditional um, walk, like being in a theater space, like people were standing at first and then um, they were like, just walk through. And it just changed the whole thing. And I think that to me is, is a lot of like, what native theater is it's it's not quite um what you expect when you walk into um a, a theater room you, you're you're thinking oh, okay all right we've got to act a certain way but then no actually this is more about living this is more about sharing this isn't about like what you're trying to like i don't know <laughs> there's there's something more to it um that's deeper and that's connected to everyone um, and you're just instantly welcomed and I think that's something that I'm learning um, every day uh, as, as I grow just the, the welcoming part being welcome in spaces and uh, welcoming other people into spaces and just always feeling like we are all connected. Mm -hmm. That must have felt so empowering just to feel that connection and to feel seen and feel heard and be heard and hear like that, that must have been really powerful. So thank yeah. you for sharing that. Mm. Tamantha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what what an amazing person. Oh my goodness. We are honored to have you. Um, Tamantha is a multidisciplinary storyteller actor, musician, songwriter, playwright, and beater, who now resides here um, on Okateo Double Edge Grounds. She believes that storytelling is a practical foundation for healing, joy, and knowledge. She draws together traditional Ojibwe knowledge systems, along with scientific and philosophical inquiry into her work as an art and survival fellow through Betty's Daughters Arts Collaborative and Double Edge Theater. Her works Now You See Me and Something Else has had readings through the Anasha Nabe Theater Exchange and the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. Her solo piece, Something Else. Anybody see that this weekend? Yeah, lots of hands up in the audience. <laughs> Something Else has been performed at the Art of Acting Studio in California, Double Edge Theater in Massachusetts, and Georgetown University in DC. Uh, Tamantha. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> As a part of Anasha Nabe Theater Exchange, you were hosting an incredible eight part series titled Wellness Through an Anasha Nabe Lens. Mm -hmm. That series introduced the audience to key elements of Anasha Nabe life ways and broke down how these gifts and responsibilities have the power to enrich our cultures, our per personal journeys, and even global society. How does traditional Ojibwe knowledge systems work to inform your playwriting? Ooh, glitch for that. Well, first I wanna say that I co-hosted this workshop series with uh, Colleen Medicine. So that work was, you know, 50-50, it was, it was very powerful, very good. That was a journey. Um, and the thing that I'm, I've learned with art specifically is that there's actually, I've learned that there's no word for art in our language. And I was taught that that's because everything is art, everything is beautiful and everything is interconnected in that way. And so when we started this workshop series, we were like, yeah, this is all, this makes sense. This is wellness, this is health, this is um, gonna help us, not only us, but hopefully other people on our journeys through life. You know, I think you, I think Colleen said, or somebody said, we're just walking each other home. And so art, I believe, is a way to do that. And using the seven grandfather systems, which is, or the system is, um, which is like bravery, humility, respect, using those concepts to 
uh, share what stories want to be told. Uh, really, it's a driving force, I should say. These teachings, the seven grandfather teachings, the that's because like who gets to tell the story? Who's telling the stories now? Who has permission to tell the stories? We need to tell our stories too. So those, all these things come together and everything's interconnected in that way. Thank you. So oh, process, deep. process is very important. Mm -hmm. So um, Rebecca, while we're still thinking about a national, day, a national day theater exchange, how did ATE form? And I don't know, what was your first play? Okay, so coming from a long line of storytellers, I usually tend to take the scenic route, but I'm gonna try and shorten it. <laughs> um, so uh, Anishinaabe Theater Exchange uh, started with a collaboration uh, between um, the University of Michigan and the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Ojibwe Indians, or Chippewa Indians, and um, they had been, uh, U of M had been brought up to, um, you know, do some performances at uh, LSSU, and um, we, we all individually were, were reached out to um, by uh, Anita Gonzalez um, to, to play a role in this, in this uh, part here, um, Mary Catherine Nagel's uh, Sliver of a Full Moon. That was our very first performance. Um, and it was a full reading. Uh, at that time, I was uh, six months pregnant with my daughter. So I was like, um, but it was very powerful. It was very powerful for all of us. Um, uh, some of us, myself, Colleen Medicine, uh, we do not have formal um, acting training background. But through that play, we were able to find that connection and find that that healing. Mm -hmm. And that's what for myself personally really set me on this road of acting and playwriting because I want to be able to, you know, to share our stories and to be heard because we've been silenced so much. Mm -hmm. So um, after that, uh, Colleen Medicine, uh, Tamantha Sylvester, and myself, um, along with Anita Gonzalez, we, we kind of collaborated for about a year, toying with the idea of uh, creating ATE. Um, it was about a year and a half later, um, I was asked if I could write a play about um, the, the, something that is close to the tribes that I live near. And where I live, it's the fishing rights. Mm -hmm. It's the fishing rights, how the struggle of those fishing rights. Um, so I wrote that uh, growing up in that, in that time, um, I had a lot of that knowledge from what our fishermen went through. Mm -hmm. But I also conducted interviews with some of our local fishermen uh, who had uh, experienced that. Um, and uh, everybody in my area knows about Big Abe LeBlanc. He is the one that purposely allowed himself to get arrested mm -hmm. to start that, that snowballing of that, that le legation of the, the fishing rights. But prior to that, um, you know, our, our men that would go out and fish just to... Uh, feed their families, would get shot, would get, would get murdered, would get, uh, they would drown. They would drown just trying to feed their families. So that was very, very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. So I wrote that play. In addition to doing a uh, partial uh, play of um, Carolyn Dunn's uh, The Fry Bread Queen. Mm -hmm. So we did these together. Um, and uh, after that, we got together again and said, yeah, let's, let's do ATE, let's do this. You know, this is, this is important to us. This is something that we need. This is something that our people need. Important. So yeah, um, so the, the three of us, uh, Tamantha, Colleen and myself, um, we have all been involved with ATE since the very beginning. And um, here we are. Thank you for sharing that important story. I think, it's really important to hear. Um, there's very definitely this connection that is made with indigenous cultures of storytelling and that shift into playwriting. 
And with indigenous playwrights, I have noticed, you know, somewhat of our cultural protocols, our ways of being, our indigenous ways of seeing the world um, are being written into scripts. And I saw that this weekend with the reading of How We Go Missing. Obviously a native play, but it contains certain aspects that are weaving stories, poetry, protocol, and even ceremony. So Carolyn, you, the storyteller, poet, playwright, <laughs> how did this transition happen for you? How did you become a blended storyteller, playwright, uh, director, something? <laughs> actor, <laughs> dramaturg, all of those, all of those wonderful uh, titles. Um, I, you know, it, like I said, it just was a natural uh, progression, I feel like, to me, to, from being a, a storyteller and a performer to, um, and a writer from very early on, um, to be able to tell stories in that way. I, I think I became a poet because I'm a little bit lazy, you know, so when the, and which is not to say that poets are lazy. I didn't mean that at all. I just meant um that I don't you know I like to write free form I don't want to have to worry about my grammar because I am an English professor in addition to being a theater professor so I'm like grammar 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 content content form form and all that western stuff and so I think being a poet um I was able to I feel like get to the story faster but I talk too much so then I thought well maybe um you know, I used to write these huge, long, epic poems, and I said, "Well, maybe I should, I should, I, you know, go back to playwriting because I had been, been doing playwriting, but in middle school and high school and college, you know, I sort of became known more as a as a poet, and then I went back to playwriting. Not until I don't think professionally until the early two thousands. Um, so, so it was a very easy transition." from, you know, from um, going, and I'm, and I'm not, and I wasn't at the time, nor have I ever been like a classically trained poet or a classically trained um, fiction writer, you know, or a classically trained storyteller, whatever that means. If it was, if that meant hanging out with my uncles and my aunts and my grandparents mm -hmm. and listening to those stories, then yes, mm -hmm. I am mm -hmm. traditionally and classically trained in that way. So, um, so in terms of you know, all of the things that we have to teach, story structure, we, you know, we have to talk about Western ways of storytelling. Um, and, and I don't really do that, at, even as a, a teacher of creative writing. Um, you know, I say you have to start with the characters, you have to start with who are they? What is their experience of the world? What is their experience to one another? And the story will come out of out of that. So um, as a, like I said, as a, a poet playwright, um, that's really what I concentrate on the most. And the, the more that you know the characters, mm -hmm. the, um, the easier the writing of the story will be because it will just come to you. And that's how, you know, we, when we were developing um, How We Go Missing, we, you know, with that came out of a commission from um, the center in um, Center for Performance and Politics at uh, Georgetown, um, out of this, out of the gathering to write a play about missing and murdered Indigenous women, from um, the perspective of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and so that's how um, that's how we were able to. Tamantha and I had a a writing and, and bead working weekend that really <laughs> turned into a one act play at a, at a certain point. Um, and so, and, but again, with an eye to indigenous storytelling technique that the story is shared by the community. Um, and so the fact that that, you know, again, right now it's a one act, we are going to develop it into a full length play. Um, and, you know, we feel that this, this story is very important. It's been a little bit of a struggle to tell it at certain points, mm -hmm. um, you know, given, given the pandemic and given what's going on in the world. But 
um, you know, again, a wonderful opportunity to share that work, which is very much rooted in a community-based practice of theater pedagogy. She said, putting her academic hat on, um, you know, that, that really the work that we do is very much centered in communities and community-based. And the stories that we tell are very much um, centered in that community practice. So let me get this straight. You wrote uh, How We Go Missing, which was based about a, a beating circle mm -hmm. while you were beating. Yes. So yeah. it was like art imitating life. Yes, very okay. much so. Just and, <laughs> and we decided in that moment, it's just a beating circle. And then for, for the men, it's going to be a drum circle. Oh, so, that's beautiful. Yeah. Continue, to be continued then. To be continued. Larissa, hi. Um, you went from ballerina to choreographer, to film writer, to playwright. What took you on the journey from film to plays? And how has agency over stories been important to you? Yeah, um, first off, don't let um, Carolyn Dunn fool you. She's one of the least lazy people I know. Um, <laughs> it's like when you said that, I was like, that is not true. Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> stories uh, for another time. Uh, yeah, so my transition, um, you know, I was, I actually, like Carolyn too, I'm not formally trained in writing at all. Um, I became a writer, um, on my own through kind of an immersion <laughs> base, I guess. I did a lot of jobs as an intern in Hollywood. I live in Los Angeles or near Los Angeles where my husband's from. And um, I did a lot of jobs to kind of learn the business of writing and then learn how to write from different mentors and such and, and kind of created my own education. Um, and then I was really fortunate to sell a couple pieces really early. I sold two TV shows quickly um, to Teen Nick and to Fox. And I found out um, pretty quickly <laughs> within six months of developing both those shows. And that was when I was a brand new writer. I had no agent. I didn't have anybody. Um, was, I didn't have a team, as they say. Um, by the time those shows um, both didn't make it on the air, I was relieved um, because at that time, you know, that was about 14 years ago now, the indigenous representation of people in Hollywood was terrible. And the um, watering down of my indigenous characters was maddening and it was constant. And I just didn't have the power of the people to fight it enough. You know, I was, and I felt like that's all I did. I just fought constantly and I wasn't enjoying myself at all. I was really hating actually, like I had these incredible opportunities and I was hating them because all I was doing was fighting every single day and losing more battles than I was winning. And when you write in film and television, the, um, they own the work. I don't own it. I'm just a writer for hire. Even when I create it, they can go off and write it with someone else and then put another writer on it at any time. So I could be fired at any time and they can take my ideas and develop them with someone else. So you have to constantly be compromising. And I just wasn't willing to spend the rest of my career doing that. Um, fortunately, right around that time, I was commissioned to write my first play at the Children's Theater Company in Minneapolis. And that's where um, when I went in, I said, look, you know, things have to be different. I just, I can't work like this. And it was when I discovered that theater at that time was willing and eager to try to change and to do things differently and to do things better and to re represent indigenous people in the right way. So um, I really just saw that that was a place where I could not just create work, but I could change the field. I'd already had a very selfish career as a ballet dancer, um, it's like the most selfish career. <laughs> it's just all about you and staring at yourself. Um, and I really wanted my next career to be something that was for the people in some way and that was creating change for others. And so I saw in theater a way that I could really create change in a whole field as opposed to just making work for myself. Um, so that's what I've done. You know, I've really devoted myself to that um, in every single, for my very first play um, and all the work I do, I do a lot of service work, a lot of work on reservations and such. And all of that is because, you know, theater is natural. It's what we do. It's what we've been doing for since the beginning of time. Um, it's just, uh, I, I can take some skills I have from the Western theater world and just sort of translate between our traditional ways of storytelling into the Western presentations of storytelling. And then I also create work that's in between the two. Um, and so I've been really fortunate that theaters embraced me in that and has really, you know, been good to me as 
you heard in my bio, <laughs> it's been really good to me and I'm so grateful for that. And um, now I'm back in film and TV again because now everything's different. I have agency, I have a team. Um, I can insist that things are done right. And I can insist that I only do stories in certain ways and with certain people and that the right consultants are hired from every tribe and that everybody's paid and um, all those things that um, they weren't willing to do 14 years ago in film and TV, they're willing to do now, which is really exciting. So I'm doing a little bit of film and TV, but next year I have five plays. I don't have a lot of time for film and TV. I've got five new shows next year. So um, I'm mostly focusing on theater right now because that's my true love. But um, film and TV certainly has a bigger reach. So I'm excited to be able to work there as well. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited to hear that you're going back into film and TV. Like film and TV is sort of exploding right now with indigenous representation. You know, for the first time ever, I have choices on my streaming device, which indigenous yeah. program do I want to see tonight? Which, um, so I'll be really excited to hear about your upcoming projects and add to my choices of being mirrored in society. So thank you. <laughs> and this, um, this agency over identity, it really has been a long, a long struggle for indigenous uh, peoples on Turtle Island. Um, Native playwrights have not had visibility in this genre in a relevant way until the last few decades, last 20 years. Um, and commonly, you know, plays really leaned heavily on stere stereotypes and caricatures when Native people were introduced um, or included. Um, and it told a vastly different story than an accurate history or uh, accuracy with contemporary issues. Um, I'm gonna quote uh, the words in your online bio, Tamantha, because I feel like it's a really, uh, it's a summation of where I wanna go next and a summation of my thoughts here. Quote, language and stories play a significant role in our world and have the power to shift and change our realities. We are constantly surrounded by images and language. The type of language we're using, the stories, we are being told and who they are being told by are critical when shaping a world of truth and connection, end quote. Beautiful. The power of language and stories are critical when thinking about how the lens is being applied. In recent efforts to decolonize spaces, by acknowledging the harmful settler, settler colonial impacts, and in turn, also having that agency over identity and language and histories. There are some powerful indigenous plays that are using storytelling methods, essentially, to educate. Larry, you are a professional storyteller of how many years? 30 years? Yes. More? Yeah, my age, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm Been giving a while. up yes. quite a while. Um, uh, and you turned playwright to tell one of these powerful historical stories um, with your play, Freedom and Season. Um, how do you see using theater as an educational role and why was that important to you? How did you get there? Uh, wow, yes, thank you. So um, I'm a writer uh, um, and uh, with some encouragement from Stacy Klein, I, I jumped into the playwriting. Um, and, uh, and so as a writer, I began the process as a writer and uh, developing the play. And before I knew it, I had about 500 pages. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, and, uh, and so I began thinking about storytelling, you know, and because, um, uh, you know, when, as a writer, they tell you, uh, you know, you're um, showing, not telling, but with um, uh, as a play, you're 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 using your body, your voice, your physicality, your emotions, and, and, and much like in storytelling. And um, so, um, yeah, freedom and season. It was a very um, uh, even now sitting here thinking about it. It was such a, a moving experience to dive into not only the research uh, to further look into what was uh, had occurred here. But to then actually relive the life of my uh, great great grandfather. So the play centers around uh, my great great grandfather. From uh, the, he was um, a Civil War soldier, and um, 
he died there uh, in the field. And while he was there, um, uh, while he died, uh, because uh, Native Americans, they were not citizens at the time, you know, so he was actually a ward of the state. Um, and so his land was confiscated. And of course, uh, his wife who was also a uh, Nipmuc. Um, she, a woman could not own land, so they confiscate the land and they take the children. And uh, this went on and on and on uh, for, for my family. There were three generations of um, children taken from our family. And in fact, my grandfather's oldest brother, which is her great grandfather, was the last one taken. Uh, he was born in 1897. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1906. Uh, my grandfather just just missed that. Um, and as you mentioned, Rhonda, I work uh, with the um, Bunker Hill Community College on developing curriculum. That's been a lifelong passion of mine, as well as the work we did with the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, creating curriculum for Indigenous youth to help help prevent um, substance misuse and deal with bullying and using our traditional approaches to kind of deal with that because we know neurocentric approach is not uh, yielded good results. And uh, so I'm excited about the work we're doing at Bunker Hill and creating this indigenous curriculum across all disciplines. And, um, you know, so freedom and season, it was, um, in some sense, it could be considered a daunting task because I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of civil war nerds out there, right? Uh, people who know all the ins and outs, but we know very little about the black and brown troops. And so uh, just diving into that history and then walking back in the shoes of my great grandfather um, and thinking about, uh, there were over 60 Nipmuc men there fighting at the same time. So, and this was happening over and over again to these, to, to my relatives. And, uh, and you think about during that time, there were probably about two to 3,000 Nipmucs in total from a number that was probably over a million uh, at time of contact. So um, this is, uh, was a devastating uh, uh, impact on the community uh, in terms of like um, usurping land and children. So this was going on and on. And, um, and so, you know, and thinking about the conditions there, anybody knows anything about it, the conditions were already horrendous for a Civil War soldier, but now when you're taking the black and brown troops, it like triples, right? And, uh, and so when I started developing the play, I wanted to really think about all that and think about, and as Carolyn mentioned, the, the place, right, in time. And so this is a man who never gone to school. He was a farmer, lived all his life using his hands, I mean, and you think about some of the things that were going on during his life because people will ask, well, why did the natives even join? Um, you know, this was um, when the Trail of Tears had just opened up, boarding school systems were in full swing, uh, um, Oregon Trail, uh, the California Gold Rush, Congress passes the Indian Appropriations Act, which is essentially saying Native Americans are confined to a reservation, you know, like, like we're some kind of zoo animals, we couldn't leave without a pass. Um, and, uh, and here in Massachusetts in 1869, the Enfr Enfranchisement Act was passed, which was the detribalization of our people. This was another way to sanction land theft. Uh, and also, you know, during that time, Lincoln creates this myth of Thanksgiving. You know, uh, this is where it really comes into fold where, you know, we have this idea of pilgrims and Indians coming together in this, you know, lofty uh, um, dinner and all that. And so, I'm looking at all these different situations that are happening. And, you know, and, and when I put that piece together, so, and the story takes place while he's in the field, he's at White Hall and different locations in the field. And he's kind of reminiscing not only on ceremony and home, but also on, on his life and finding that humor. You know, if you've seen the play, you know that there's these very funny parts in it. And it kind of emphasizes that native humor, that spirit of, of buffering that pain through laughter and, and trying to, you know, um, Kind of mask that pain because you know that's all we were really doing is masking it you know and that that uh generational trauma which had carried on so um so i used this opportunity uh in that short piece to to hit home in the same way i use my writing is to use that as an educational opportunity to tell a story about what's going on in his life you know and um he'll mention parts where he's doesn't have the right to sing and, you know, and reminding the audience that have come into his world, you know, we can't really tell anybody that I'm speaking my language because, you know, I can be, you know, put in jail or worse. And, uh, and, and then, you know, we've recovered some of the original letters that we had from that period, which is really powerful. And I shared part of that in the play and, uh, um, and the humor of my ancestors, you know, our relatives where he talks about sleeping in the tent and uh, the, uh, the, the bed bugs and termites were so large that they would use a, uh, use bow and arrow practice and one would drag him out of the bed at night if he missed them. And, you know, these humorous letters and it's just really powerful. And 
how they would uh, share that. And so I wanted to bring folks into that world and, and really dive deeper into understanding what happened to our people and why things are the way they are today. And I think uh, having that agency and having that ability and you know, being in spaces like this to get that opportunity. And, and I think about where would, where would we be without being able to share these stories, you know? And, uh, and this is, and as Larissa mentioned, we're just at the beginning, we're just at the tip of this. It's like really exciting to, to watch this develop and grow. So um, it was really exciting for me to do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and I appreciated how, when you were telling the story <coughs> of, you know, the correct history and something that not very many people knew about, you were also telling stories of the seasons yes, yes so you were doing like a a two-fold storytelling like that was just that was beautiful yes, um and jasmine when i met you oh my goodness so it was 2016 you were a umass student and we were headed off to the ceremony um of the deer island paddle and you were working on making your musical uh, 1675 can you talk a little bit about what drew you to tell that piece, that educational piece, and what it is that you wanted to accomplish? Well, I love history, um, and I, I love engaging with the stories, with, with stories of, of people, um, and I always have. And um, I have a tendency to talk to the people around me as if they know things that I know, and then learn, oh, I have to see if they know that first. And then um, in that realizing that no one knew anything about Deer Island or King Philip's War that I talked to at all. And I was like, whoa, why don't, why don't people know this? Why, don't, why isn't this not just common knowledge? This is one of the most important pieces of history on this land like especially concerning the um, evolution of the Americas, right? Like it's, it's a turning point, it's a pivotal moment. And um, the story of Deer Island itself is just so extremely tragic. I mean, talking about the boarding schools, talking about taking children away, it, it begins much, much, much earlier, right? It begins with these, there were praying towns that were established by Reverend John Elliott. Um, he came about um, in like the 19 or 1630s, and um, he was Christianizing Native people um, in Massachusetts, and um, a lot of these people, Nipmuc people. And um, around the time the King Philip's War happened, the General Court of Massachusetts said, "Okay." we're gonna use that. We're gonna keep them in that spot. And um, there was essentially a lockdown placed on that. And then from that lockdown, there were um, in the middle of the night in October, 1675, they, uh, they showed up with chains and carts and they took people away. Um, there were about six carts mm -hmm. for 200 people um, who lived in the town and they just showed up at midnight and they said, all right, pack your stuff, <laughs> you're leaving. And people begged them to, to tell them where they were going. Um, they never did, um, not until they were already going down the river um, to this barren island where they were not allowed to, um, to do anything to preserve themselves. And they were left there for nine months um, with nothing really. Um, there were some provisions that were brought mostly though people came and paraded heads around and tried to get them to, uh, sorry, content warning. No, not sorry. Um, <laughs> know your history. Um, but they're, um, they tried to get them to be spies for them and tried to, you know, there's, and there and were, these were all people. not all Nipmuc people. There mm. were um, a lot of Nipmuc people. <coughs> um, mm. Our ancestors, mm -hmm. definitely the people who are here today are people who survived that that um, yeah. yeah yeah and um so i i thought well i'm gonna tell this story and i thought um the best way to tell it without having it be um three plays was to uh put it into music because mm -hmm. i think that music 
speaks volumes where words cannot. And um, I decided to write a musical in about a year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and uh put up a brand new show in about two months <laughs> and it happened it did. Um, it most and certainly i'm did. looking forward to the process mm -hmm. of doing it again mm -hmm. um but with a little more time, more time. Yeah. and giving it beautiful. the grace it deserves yeah beautiful well, thank you for sharing that and um speaking of rolling heads and parading <laughs> heads around <laughs> Larissa is like, oh, that's me. <laughs> Larissa, I have watched and I have read the Thanksgiving play <laughs> and I have read What Would Crazy Horse Do? Um, you know, both have, and also going back to what Larry was saying, humor, uh, both have this educational side that is painful and yet deeply satirical, that humor, um, but in different ways. Um, in the Thanksgiving play, the humor takes the edge off of some of the serious jabs that you're throwing at these performative white wokeness like folks. Um, and the dark humor in What Would Crazy Horse Do is almost coded for indigenous people, um, our, our ability to laugh at painful topics. Um, is there a story behind the humor in Thanksgiving play? And did you use humor perhaps maybe as the salve for ripping off the proverbial woke band-aid? <laughs> wow. <laughs> First time I've heard proverbial woke band-aid. Um, <laughs> I like it. Uh, that'll be in my next play. Um, yeah, you know, I, I always say to people, we're native people like on this continent, are, and I'm sure on many others, but I, I'm only speaking for us, are, are living like the longest, darkest, blackest comedy, you know, there is. And we're still living it. We're living this black, black comedy every day, just the ridiculousness of our continued existence on this occupied land where we're still being erased. Um, we have to laugh or cry. So, um, you know, it's just natural to use humor, as Larry was saying, and, you know, in everything we do. Um, I think, you know, for me, though, also as a theater goer, I just, I, I'm, I love really you know difficult plays but i don't like being like beaten over the head with things and um so for me i enjoy you know getting to enjoy myself when i go to theater um i, I like to you know whether that's enjoying the darkness or the music or the heaviness or you know the drama or the comedy and i just happen to be a pretty good comedy writer so um my plays, I call them comedies, uh, satirical comedies. And so there's certainly dark satire. Um, uh, what would Crazy Horse do, especially? It's a very, very dark satire. Um, but it's interesting how many people, you know, endlessly, 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 still today, after, you know, I'm writing all these comedic plays, I'm writing a full out satirical farce for the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles next summer. Um, but even then, still people are like, ooh, I laughed. Is that okay? Because they feel like, I don't know, native things can't be funny, which is just insane to any native people. <laughs> That's all we do is laugh when we're together. So, um, you know, I'm always fighting with that, with, you know, wanting to create these spaces that are joyful and are fun. And, and kind of, I would say it's to reward my audience. Like you got off the couch, you came to the theater, you spent a lot of money. Um, thank you. <laughs> have some fun. Enjoy, you know, having fun together. Um, laughter, actually, like they have like the science of how much um, time, like you get back in your life from laughter. It's really fantastic. And so the more you laugh together, especially with other people, you actually add minutes to your life. And I was like, how cool is that? Like theater isn't just life-saving in like, you know, so many amazing ways, but it's also life-saving that you're getting more time through laughter. And, and so that's something I love doing. I love getting in a room with laughing with people. And I love people that are non-native audiences, which, you know, to be honest, where I work is 90% of my audiences are not native. And so letting them see that we laugh <laughs> and that we are, yes, it's okay that you laughed and yes, we're funny. And um, that we deal with, you know, incredibly dark topics through laughter. Um, as you referenced, there is one very, very dark scene in the Thanksgiving play that 
like Jasmine, I don't apologize for it. It's true. It happened. It's reality. And um, it's funny because people get so freaked, non-native people get so freaked out. They're so worried about the scene and about staging it, whatever. And I say, just wait, wait till the natives come. And they're always laughing harder than anybody at like the most gruesome scene because we know it. We know this history. And it's like, sorry, but y'all are going to have to face it too. And you know, you don't have to laugh at it. That's great. Um, if you weren't aware of how gruesome, incredibly gruesome the history was around Thanksgiving and, and around you know, the people that lived in that, in that area, in that period, and all of us, but this is specifically about them, then, you know, it, you, you need to listen. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the Native people get to laugh about it because we've been through it, sadly, and we're still going through it. Um, and my hope is, you know, others can enjoy themselves, but also can learn some things and um, start learning more. That's always my goal with my plays is that you go home with more questions than answer than you had even before you went in, and that you have to then start looking up the answers. And that's your job after my play. Beautiful. And I, I really appreciate, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen the Thanksgiving play, but there was one scene where it, they're putting together a play for school children. And one of the possible scenarios is kicking around the heads of native people, because that's what happened. It sounds awful, but it was actually, I die. I split a gut laughing. I was like, oh my gosh, for real? Like that was hilarious. <laughs> one of the, right? One of the darkest things that you could possibly imagine was pulled off in such a way. Um, I don't but, know, I, like I said. It, but, like I, 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 but what I think too is that, you know, what, what she's also saying is that, you know, nine, in, in Los Angeles, you know, 90% or Tabongna, I should say, um, and ninety percent of the audience isn't going to be Indian, but there's those ten Indians in the audience <laughs> that are just cracking up because that's yes, you know. I mean, and 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 the idea that you know that we've been laughing at our own tragic comedy, you know, for mm -hmm. the last five hundred years. So, yeah. you know, of course it's funny. Absolutely, and Tamantha, you have written quite a bit of humor into your play, something else, right? And some of that. Even like even the title is tongue in cheek, yeah. something else, because yeah. that's what was it CBS? No, yeah. CNN. CNN. I CNN think. called yeah. us something yeah. else during the last election cycle. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, now we're creatures. So. Now we're creatures. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but you also educate in a pretty serious tone, mm -hmm. and I, I messaged you the other day because when I um, rewatched your play. You had a quote, um, and finally, how the education system, the economic system, the justice system, and any other system you can think of has failed each and every citizen in this country when it comes to inclusion and respect for the bodies beneath our feet mm. and mm. our descendants and their descendants, unquote. Mm. Right? That was just really powerful. But you also have this way of being light and having fun game show host, you know? Um, so what is your, you know, how do you use that humor to diffuse the audience that you're, you're basically, you're educating them with seriousness. Do you use that humor as a connecting point or a diffusing point? All of the above, mm -hmm. I would say. <laughs> um, I, to echo I, everybody, humor is medicine, basically. And, you know, if anybody knows my family, you'll know that we just, we go nuts. Um, that's my mother sitting over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. But I also think of humor as a way to, to open up the heart space specifically. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think, Isaac Murdoch talks about this a lot of revolution of the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really a key component to where we're at as a society in this moment in time, we have to open our hearts to listen to each other and to actually move us forward together. You know, it's not just one group or the other, we have to move forward together at this point. And so humor has been, um, you know, it can show you the middle ground type of thing and it can help us reach those moments of understanding of respect for one another, which I think we've also lost. I mean, where's the respect for each other? Um, and this humor, it's also, it's not to negate the negative things that are happening. It's to make it more bearable and to 
you just soften the soften the edge a little bit. But yeah, that's did I answer the question right there. Absolutely, <laughs> answer the question. Okay. Um, you know, you you mentioned a little bit softening the edge and healing humor, laughter is mm -hmm. healing, right? Yeah. So I kind of want to explore a little bit about how this work can be a form of healing. Mm -hmm. um, Carolyn, your plays such as How We Go Missing, mm -hmm. Fry Bread Queen, and Soldad are about deeply interconnected individuals mm -hmm. that talk about intergenerational traumas, relationships, lateral violence, and ultimately healing. Mm -hmm. um, do you consider this work to be healing with humor, healing with traditional protocols, healing through education? Mm -hmm. Is this a catharsis? Mm -hmm. Ooh, mm. talk about an Aristotelian term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> catharsis. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, and I think it's very much related to what we've all been talking about, about not being afraid to um, showcase the humor and not being afraid to really go there. Um, you know, and, and I think in, you know, like the, the, the scene in the Freiburg cream where Jesse puts the gun in the freezer, you know, I mean, that's unexpected and, you know, and then <laughs> come to find out later what the gun was used for and, and, you know, and, and those moments and it's just sort of, you know, like Indians in unexpected places, you know, uh, trauma in unexpected places, because that's where, that's where we find it. We find our, our trauma in unexpected places. Um, I'm, you know, I, and I'm very deliberate in my work about, you know, when you look at a scene or you look at how a play or how a story is crafted. And, you know, I tell my students this, you look at how it's crafted. There's two people and they each have a secret from each other and they are not gonna give that secret up. So they'll change the subject when we start getting too close. And so I talk about in terms of scene structure, that's how you structure a scene. Mm -hmm. And you know, where are the turns? Let's locate where the turns are in each, you know, in each scene. Um, and I am not afraid to push the envelope, especially mm -hmm. with how we go missing and it can be very you know so those folks that that saw it last night quite a uh, and the and on friday night um you know it's it can get pretty graphic in in which the women are detailing sexual assault Mikaela's character for example um you know she really details uh her own sexual assault and because people need to know that this actually happens. Mm -hmm. It's um, fictionalized, you know, in, in that moment, but there have been other um, plays where I address missing and murdered indigenous women and folks say, oh, you're talking about the such and such case that happened in Arcata, you know, in Northern California. I said, no, I said, I didn't base that on anything because mm -hmm. I know that this happens and it's a common story. So I am not afraid to, um, to really push people in emotional ways because this is the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth, again, in unexpected places, but also, you know, there's something in me that, that also that, I don't know, whatever that little trickster comes out and says, okay, we got to put something funny in here to kind of lighten the tension a little bit. Um, and that's, you know, for... The audience as well as the actors because the mm -hmm. actors have to go there mm -hmm. and 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 you know it, and in storytelling you as the t as the storyteller you as the actor in the particular role that you're playing you have to go there too and so um so always you know putting in that little bit of humor to kind of you know give everybody a break and then come back in and say okay but you know we still have to talk about this, we still have to have this conversation. And the fact that Larissa's talking about, all right, well, you know, so are we gonna kick the heads of the, you know, of the Indians around? You know, I mean, and that's, you know, it's so horrible, but it's like, yeah, but it happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm not afraid to tell the story of this happening. And we can't, you know, we can't spare people's feelings anymore. <laughs> I feel like when it comes to, issues that are so 
um, prevalent in Indian country that really aren't anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to continue to tell that truth in that way. Thank you for that. That brings up another question <clears throat> that I just, how do you take care of, you mm -hmm. know, the actors? Mm. When they're taking, what, you know, three out of four Native women suffer from either domestic violence or sexual assault. That's almost all of us. Uh -huh. um, how, and these topics are really heavy. How do you take care of the actors that are, that are doing this piece? Right. Is, there, is there like a, yeah. a moment where there's a recognizing and releasing of this trauma? Like yeah, we do, we, you know, it, in, in the work at, with ATE and, and Oklahoma Indigenous and, and even, you know, to at some points, you know, with, with the Autry at Native Voices, um, and we've incorporated this in, you know, at, at the university I teach at, that we do smudge, you know, and we do bring people in um, to smudge. We have, um, you know, we had a trauma consultant that we, you know, that I'd worked with before. I think how we deal with it as a Anishinaabe theater company is just to really tease each other, you know, and it, which is also a very, you know, when you're with family, y'all know, when you're with family, you know, oh, just the barbs just keep coming, just keeps coming. <laughs> but it's all, you know, in a very loving and good natured way um, to keep us humble, you know, and, and I think that that's, um, you know, in production, incorporate a lot of self healing, self healing, um, incorporate um, checking in with each other, you know, incorporate that in, incorporate that time for, um, for people to take their time that they need to come and, and honor that, you know, and I think, and especially um, for those that are directors also that are, you know, are in, in this group um, to work with a director that has an understanding and, um, and a connection to the material and a connection to the actors to understand the work that the actors have to do in this particular situation is to give the care and the time that's needed for self-care especially Absolutely. and to create that safe space in rehearsal mm -hmm. well that's so important you know um yeah taking that breath taking that moment um and really processing um so now we've heard Today, how there's this natural connection between storytelling and traditional ways of transmitting knowledge through playwriting um, and how education and humor are really important companions. Finally, I, I want to hear about how Indigenous theater um, has been supporting and lifting Indigenous communities in some pretty important ways. Um, Larissa, I am going back to your conversation about how, um, you know, you, you have certain requirements and uh, when you're doing a piece, I, I also remember you telling me how you were integrating a local indigenous tribe to be a part of a performance uh, by having an artisan market uh, with local native arts and having conversations uh, with theater staff regarding indigenous protocols. Um, and you've also said before that you have two requirements for doing a play. Can you talk about these requirements and teaching these protocols and inclusion and why this is so important? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, yeah, it was kind of just you know inherent in the kind of work I was trying to do from the beginning. Um, I uh, well, my two when I'm creating a new play with the theater company, the two um, I call them challenges. I, I present to them um, are one that I can't be the only native art in the season and I can't be the only native person paid when my um, play is going up in the season. So, um, and then I work with the theaters to figure out how to fulfill those challenges. Um, one of the things I do is I have my um, theaters take what I, uh, time, <laughs> I, know, I guess training with me, I call it Indian 101. Um, really it's just a basic cultural competency um, learning how to welcome 
Native people into theater. The theaters I'm working in are primarily Western theaters. So that means they are um, white culture. Uh, and they are very specifically <laughs> Western white culture. And it's fascinating how many theaters have no idea that they are Western white culture uh, and the completely foreign culture to many, many people, not just native people, but many people that live in the United States. And they don't realize that it's not just, um, why can't they learn the rules, but that it's a completely different culture you're asking us to step into that we um, may not want to, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And, um, and then that we have to suppress so much of our own culture just to enter a theater space. And so I really try to help them understand that and see where they can start making changes and, and make the theater spaces that I work in primarily more welcoming to indigenous peoples and specifically, you know, they're local indigenous people. So that's one of the first things we start with is whose land are you on? What has your relationship been? If it hasn't been good or you don't have one, why, how do we start, et cetera. And that, you know, working with me and my play is a great place to start that relationship and hope it grows. Um, so we do that, but yeah, then the amazing things have come out of it. You know, some of my plays have had, um, I've done three plays now with Cornerstone Theater Company and those plays are specifically in and with community. And so those end up being gigantic <laughs> community affairs sometimes. The one we did in Arizona had over 400 native artists working on it. Um, it's incredible. We presented you know, their work in the marketplace and um, performances before, during, and after the theatrical part, you know, all through the show. It was pretty incredible. We have, um, and we just give you space for native people to do whatever they want to do um, for the local Native people. Uh, I also, though, um, in my plays, really make sure that I was, like I said before, hire local consultants, cultural consultants, uh, make sure the theater is paying if they want to, you know, do a land acknowledgement, which many of them have never done still. Um, then I make sure they're paying local Native people to help them with that work because that cultural work is been won through blood. And, um, and so I make sure that the least they can do is, you know, pay them some money so that doesn't cost them any, anything in uh, material ways um, to do that work. Um, I also um, try to make sure that um, when they're fulfilling these different ways of um, paying back, you know, and, and, and in, including a local community um, that, you know, whenever possible, that it does include money, you know, <laughs> they're, they're profiting off of us, right? They're, everybody in this country is profiting off of blood money. So the least they can do is start some rep, um, uh, reparations by paying that money back to native people and putting it in our hands. So often that's turned into markets. A lot of my plays have native art markets in the lobbies. And so, um, it's great. Uh, when I was at Kansas City Rep, they the first weekend, these ladies uh, sold out all of their earrings. They're really upset because they're like, we just sold out all of our earrings in one weekend and, you know, powwow season is starting and we're in trouble. So, you know, you got to get feeding really fast. Um, but, you know, it's, it's great. So, you know, we have people, we have white people with money who are potentially coming to my play because they have some interest in Native American um, ideas and, and concepts and culture. And so I can use play, my theater spaces as a way to bring those folks together and let the white folks spend their money on native art. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, it's, it's been really successful um, every time we've done that. It's been really lovely and successful. Um, there's been lots of other ways we've had, you know, native, um, uh, caterers now become the, like the official caterers at different theater companies. We've commissioned Native artists to do things in the lobbies. You know, there's so many different things have come out of just giving these challenges to these theaters, and they've really stepped up to it in beautiful ways. Commissions. Um, Maddie Sayed is touring a show called Where We Belong, and that actually was first presented through one of these. Um, these partnerships I had at Playwrights Horizons where we, every Monday we presented, during my play, we presented other Native um, theater readings in the spaces, on, on the stage, and hers was one of them that we um, got up and it was its very, very first reading and now she's, you know, touring the country with it. It's at the Public Theater in New York. Um, it's become such a popular piece. So I'm really proud of, of those things that have, um, those those first connections with theaters and native audiences that, you know, I'm able to help facilitate through my work. And that's really why I do it, right? Is um, just to be able to, I would say for me, theater is kind of a money laundering scheme. I mean, it's a bad one because we don't get paid a lot, but it's a money laundering scheme for me. It's a way to get, you know, uh, grants and things and then pass it through to community and support community and other artists to continue to make their work. That's beautiful, beautiful.
Um, there was a couple of things that you spoke about was two challenges. Why do you call them challenges? Um, you know what? I, I don't like to demand because <laughs> then it gets everybody scared. But if I challenge them, then they feel like they have to rise to the challenge. You know, um, I, I think, you know, demands frighten people. And as in general, to be honest, I mean, you know, theaters are always nervous when they bring me in. Um, they know I'm going to be clear. They know I'm going to be honest. Um, they know that I'm going to work in a particular way that challenges them and stretches them beyond what they're comfortable with. So I try to like, make the language something that they can rise to as opposed, you know, a demand is something that you're butting against. The challenge is something that you can win and, and then they can do well. And I can say, whoa, good job. You won. You, you beat that challenge and, and yay, who doesn't want to win? Um, so that's why I use that wording. Yeah, that's, that's, that's perfect. That's really beautiful. I like, you know, what, what I thought about was like mission impossible at first, you know, your mission, should you choose to accept it? <laughs> And then it blows up. Um, <laughs> but no, I like I like the idea of challenges um, because they really truly are challenges when we're not seen in mainstream society. You know, how do people make us seen? Um, and and Larissa, I saw on your Facebook post uh, recently about how you were went to go get tickets um, at the box office. And what is the name under? Fast horse. Oh, and it yeah. went through this big long ordeal. And you've also spoken about how you will train, you know, uh, front of house. If there's an elder, they get a seat. Um, yep. Sometimes there are names like fast horse. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that kind of education as well? Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's endless. I almost, I mean, still now. You know, I've kind of been in theater a while now, um, and almost every time I go to pick up tickets, and in fact, um, once at a, a theater company that I was working in, my play was in the season, behind me on a big screen, a TV screen from the box office was my head, you know, as it is right now, in fact, very similar to what you're seeing, um, was my big head on a screen, and my play going by, because it's coming up next in the season, I went up to opening night, and I asked the woman, you know, I said, um, I'm picking up tickets for Fast Horse, and she said, well, first she said, I need your last name, and I said, it's Fast Horse, so she looked at me, and she went, I need your actual last name, and I was like, oh, here we go again, it's like, my last name is Fast Horse, F-A-S-T-H-O-R-S-E, and she's like, really? And I was like, yeah, you know, we went back and forth, like it took a while. And, I, and, you know, the little box of tickets is sitting in front of her. And I'm thinking, you know, my face is literally right behind me with my name on the screen. And I'm like, okay, you know, we'll just go through this again. And so I go through the whole thing until she finally literally like sighed. And this is a woman in her twenties. This is not like, some, you know, old, old woman that we're always like making fun of or something. This is a young woman. And that's a, a UCLA student, um, actually a theater student. And uh, she rolled her eyes and said, fine. And like looked and saw that my name was there under fast horse. Um, but this is constant this. And of course then, so I go through this, I go through this whole song and dance. And then as soon as I'm done, I'm immediately, because I have that agency and I have that privilege, I'm immediately on the phone with the artistic director of that theater company. I say, Hey, here's Here's what happened. You need to fix this now. Um, if you want to, you say you want to invite indigenous people in and yet you make us fight for our name and fast horse is in English. I mean, it's not even a, in Lakota. <laughs> it's like, it's two really easy English words. Um, but, you know, I have to fight every time. And that's just part of, you know, people try to blow it off like it's, oh, well, you know, whatever. They're just not used to it. I'm like, no, that's, that's the continued erasure of us as humans. That's the continued erasure of us as indigenous people. Um, the fact that they, you know, my name's already been shortened tremendously just to fit into English. Um, and so, you know, what little bit of my name I have left, I'm not going to give up just be for, you know, white people's comfort. Um, so, you know, it's something that I, I am constantly educating folks on. Um, I work with, you know, immediately I'm on the phone with the artistic director and saying, okay, here's what happened. You know, you got to fix this now. And, um, and they um, have all found different ways to, you know, remedy that whenever it happens. But unfortunately, it continues to happen again and again. And it's exhausting. And, I, and it's wild, too, because I'm like, how many people are, like, trying to scam their way into theater tickets using the name Fast Horse? I mean, <laughs> is, is that a thing? <laughs> like, are people sneaking around trying to scam opening night theater tickets all the time using weird names? Um, like, you Smith, you you know, Johnson, like that would get you in probably, but I don't know. Um, so anyway, it's, it's constant, but it is part of our erasure. It's serious. So again, I'm laughing about it, but it's part of our erasure. It's actually 
you know, getting rid of me as a human, taking away my ancestors. They're trying to take my ancestors from me who carried that name through blood and death to give it to me, who survived all those things, those hundreds of years of fighting and death to give me that name. And um, I'm not gonna let them take it. Um, and it's serious and it's very upsetting every time it happens. So I keep fighting, but hopefully I won't have to fight too much longer. Oh, that's beautiful. And thank you for sharing that. And as well, making sure that there's proper remuneration for your staff and for everyone else who's working with the production. I think that's also very important. Um, I know that here um, at with Double Edge Theater and with the performances in Freedom of Season, Living Presence, um, something else, uh, National Bay Theater Exchange, um, that Stacy has been very clear that we have tickets for indigenous folks to come. We send personal invitations to elders and, and our indigenous community to be here and participate. We don't wanna have a paywall, we wanna have inclusion. Um, and as well, Larry, after um, seeing Freedom in Season, you know, we noticed that there was this need to have more education on the topic of your play. Um, so that the audience would have a better understanding of what they just witnessed. Um, and Stacy really heard our ask. Um, and the following year, you set up a, a panel talk with scholars and tribal citizens after the performance. Can you talk about that importance of having a performance and a platform for the panel? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for all that, Larissa, because uh, I just want to quickly mention too, um, um, you know, growing up in the 80s as an artist, I've been, you know, doing this all my adult life. And uh, as you mentioned about paying artists and, uh, you know, many times uh, folks would just to get their name out or their work seen, they were doing it for free because nobody would pay them or was considered a niche genre. Uh, and so I am just really, um, I'm so moved just sitting here and being in this place now of, of, the, of the access and, and opportunity, even though it's, it's still, we still have a, a very long way to go. And that's why I just wanted to hit on for a moment in terms of um, uh, black and brown theater. Whereas, you know, uh, uh, as Larissa mentioned, part of the, the main reason is funding, right? And so we know that white arts organizations generally get about 70 to 75% of their funding from everyday people, whether it's a dollar or a million dollars. And uh, black and brown are getting about 6%. And for indigenous, it's probably even lower because we're not even quantifiable because we 2%, okay, thank you. And so um, if we're relying on grants and funding from the government, which are, you know, they're like jaundiced most of the time. And so we have to shut down and we can't pay our people. So it's like, uh, go create your art or, uh, uh, go to your job and you know if you don't go to your job your lights are going to get turned off or you're not going to be able to so these are the juxtapositions that we're put in to create and uh i mean this is like just it's really mind-blowing in terms of like the plays the artistic development all the different things that we've never seen yet have have yet to be created and i think uh, isaac murdoch mentioned that about when somebody asked him what was the best play you ever saw he said it probably hasn't been created yet and like you mentioned, Rhonda, growing up the Peter Pan and the Thanksgiving and all these crazy things we we're kind of inculcated into watching. And so um, there was remains a tremendous amount of talent and creativity yet to be explored. And, and the way that's going to happen is that we as everyday citizens, and this is like my big plea to the where I advocate quite a bit now is for folks, everyday folks of all walks of life to invest in indigeneity, indigenous arts, uh, whether it's a dollar or using your leverage to get access to help us be seen and help us not get stopped at the box office and and create this you know these microaggressions that continue to happen and you know and kind of respect our agency um and so but uh you know so going back to Rhonda's question and uh you know after I uh did freedom and season as I said it was a very moving it was a essentially like a possession right and uh even myself after I, I uh after after it was over I think um and it was a primarily white audience and it was really, um, they were so jarred by what they just witnessed. They didn't know, they were kind of like avoiding me. They were, they were like even afraid to talk to me or, and then I was in an awkward position because I felt like I wanted some comfort after what I just shared, you know, we talked about, you know, childs being taken away and you, you saw this man cry and fall to the ground as his children, as he's out there fighting for a country that still doesn't love him. 
And he gets this letter from home where his children had just been taken away because they're savages. And now he's like, what am I doing here? Like, and you know, and so um, uh, again, again, I think the audience was not pre emotionally prepared for it. And so I think a lot of the audience, again, was primarily white. They just wanted to get the hell out of there or they were really trying to come to terms with um, uh, a lot of the history that is still, uh, we have to uh, deal with. And, um, and so, and so we, we developed these panels to, to, to kind of address that. And Rhonda did an opening to kind of prepare folks. And then um, one of my elders, uh, Cheryl Watching Crow, she came in uh, the following year as we, we did the play and also brought in my other cousins to, to make it a more developed piece to, to be in, in, in the play itself. But after the play itself, we had um, um, a dialogue where she, um, she went through point by point on a PowerPoint and, and just laid out the history very plainly about here's the records, here's where the children were taken, here's where the land was taken and showed the systematic erasure, the, the systematic abuse of children. And, and so that folks actually have something to um, dig further into and investigate and kind of really like um, reflect on and to you know, see where they can lean into this, lean into the, to their own, uh, 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 understanding of of uh, what's what's taking place here, and uh, and so and so I was really pleased with with the way that uh, came out. I think that was I think that was really beautiful, and I think that it gave it it furthered these relationships as Larissa and you are, are both saying that you we need to have relationships and have these relationships being built on reciprocity, trust understanding, listening, and learning. And so, you know, I have these hopes. I have these hopes that we're gonna continue to build relationships, you know, on laughter, on deep listening, and, you know, have that growth happen even if it is painful to listen because, you know, um, growth is not easy. And- I just wanna to add to, as you just mentioned mm -hmm. too, um, uh, when you were, talking about how do we take care of ourselves, and, and again, mm -hmm. so that was the first time I, that was like, I think one of the first opening nights of that play when I did it the first time. And so I wasn't prepared emotionally. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was reflecting that back to the audience that, cause I was like, wow, I was in this place, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and, and as they weren't. And so we really had to, as you said, take care of ourselves, take care of the audience to help bring that context to them. Like, this is what you're, this is what's happening. So, yes. No, that was very important. And I did see that. I, I actually didn't know what Freedom and Season was about. I asked Larry and he's like, well, you know, it's about my, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, you yeah. know, you didn't want to let in on it, right, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so when I actually saw it, I was like, I don't know, uh, shell shocked. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like walking away from this, like, what did I just see? Does anybody else know what I just saw? Do they understand the history of what I just saw? Like there needs to be a, a further conversation. And then talking with Larry afterwards, you were like, nobody wants to talk to me. I'm like I'm the pariah here. <laughs> you know, but that was, that was that added to the trauma of doing an already traumatic yeah. piece right. of not being seen, not being heard. And um, yes. how do you counter that? You counter that with additional learning and educational piece where there are other people in your community that come in and support you. Um, so I did what I could. I, I opened up the, um, the evening with a little bit of a, a warning about what we were seeing. And we had other amazing acts with your first Freedom in Season. And so I was able to tie everything in together. Um, and prepare people that this is, you know, you're entering ceremony is essentially what I said. Um, you're entering into other people's traumas. So let's be respectful of that. And how can we support um, each individual artist as they're going through this? Um, because that's a lot to have to go through and relive um, night after night and not get any uh, support afterwards. Um, Whew. Right, so these, these conversations are very important um, and our racial and social justice conversations, they are uncomfortable, um, but these are our truths. These are our stories. These are our collective paths. 
that we need to come together in unity and in understanding in order to heal. We have to join together. Um, you know, just being here and actively listening, right? That's a starting point. Um, and I hope that you have found some inspiration through our panelists um, and playwrights throughout the weekend. Um, if I, I hope that, that most of you folks have seen um, something else and, and how we go missing. Um, and I'm sure some of you have seen Freedom and Season. Um, but this is, this is the important part is deeply listening. Um, I, I, I kind of want to open it up. We do have a couple minutes of time, a um, little less than 10 minutes maybe. Um, if anybody else on the panel has anything that they would like to add to the conversation, or if we have any questions from our audience. Because I'm shocked, you know? I just like, I have to moderate a panel with playwrights. How am I going to do this? <laughs> is that Janice? Yes. Janice. Um, I would love to hear what you guys uh, think about one of my favorite films, which I always um, feel nudged up against. What do you think about Little Big Man? A clock. Oh, oh, wow. Ooh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to actually teach a, um, a film class, like images of Indians in film. Um, and that was one of the, the, uh, the films that I taught in that class. And I, you know, I think each generation seems like it has its, um, like, breakthrough kind of native story. And, you know, and how I teach that film class is that I historicize for students what was going on at the world, in the world. So Little Big Man, although it, um, you know, it had a, the story of, of a particular battle and there were native folks, native actors on that particular set, it really wasn't about native people. It was about the Vietnam War and it was an allegory for the war that and an allegory for US imperialism. So um, to talk about it from, from in that sense, you know, then I think the next generational film would be Dances with Wolves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though that, you know, and historicize that film for its time when it came out, there weren't a lot of, you know, native folks getting work, you know, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of film work. And so, you know, and to actually have the language, to have the Lakota language um, there and to have Doris Charging Elk teaching the language and teaching the other actors who were not Lakota how to speak the language. I mean, I think you know, again, to historicize it and say this was an amazing, um, you know, a, an amazing kind of watershed moment for Native actors at its time, but then there was nothing for a long time. Um, and, and, and I'm encouraged now with, um, you know, it, in Canada, there's always, you know, there's, there was funding for films about Native folks. Mm -hmm. There, there's a, you see a lot more native um, themed stories coming out of Canada because of the public broadcasting system in Canada and because there is a little bit more visibility of indigenous people in Canada, here not so much. So it's really encouraging to be in this moment in time where, um, you know, that Larissa's talking about projects that she's working on. Um, the um, the TV series that Princess Lukasz Johnson mm -hmm. um, spearheaded the show, the PBS Molly and, of Denali. Yes, Molly of Denali. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm like, okay, somebody help me out and whisper it in my ear because <laughs> I was having a senior moment. Um, you know that show, um, of course, Reservation Dogs, Rutherford Falls. Mm -hmm. You know all of the shows. All of our friends are getting, you know, in in and I, you know, because Larissa's right there in front of me in a screen. 
um, that our friends our, our friends are getting you know work on, which is really exciting. Dark winds, you know, that you actually have indigenous people that are serving as executive producers and showrunners. That's exciting. And for, you know, the world to take notice that there is, you know, because in, in that world, it, it is about, um, you know, we were just talking about this with Mika this morning about this, you know, the sort of capitalist industry and, you know, and yeah, there is a lot of native people out there mm -hmm. who have never really seen themselves on television until now. You know, so it's like, yes, there is a market, even though we've been saying it, right? We've been mm -hmm. saying it for how long, um, you know, suddenly now other folks are starting to notice. So, you know, green lighting other indigenous, um, you know, film projects and series projects. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we're in an exciting moment now mm -hmm. where, where suddenly other people who are in those positions of power are taking notice mm -hmm. of um, of the work that indigenous people are doing and the stories that we're telling. It is exciting, but we have to we have to keep it up and mm -hmm. we have to keep you know moving moving in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think you know a, a great question you know for for that period of time. But the fact is, is that, you know, then how many years were there between so Little Big Man and then Dances with Wolves? And then how many years between Dances with Wolves and Reservation Dogs? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, um, you know, a lot more years in between those two than there were Little Big Man. And, you know, but again, the focus of those stories was from a non-Native perspective. You know, the narrators, the people we're supposed to root for were non-Native and the mm -hmm. Native characters mm -hmm. were supporting characters. Um, and how nice it is to see, a, you know, something, a TV series that's filmed in the Creek Nation um, in Oklahoma that, you know, you recognize all of the people, first of all, because all of the extras are people from that community. So you recognize all the, but then you recognize those cultural touch points um, and because you have two indigenous showrunners running that, or EPs that run that show, um, we don't have to be explained to what this all means. You know, if you want to know more about, you know, they're, they don't specifically say that, you know, they're Muscogee um, kids, but, you know, the, one of the showrunners is Muscogee. And, you know, and that's all, like I said, it's all filmed in the Creek Nation. So, um, you know, but but how nice it is to just sort of be dropped into that community and just kind of expect to know everything about that community is, and even if you're not from there. Thank you for that. And I really appreciate um, pointing out the sometimes indigenous stories get siloed into historical context mm -hmm. and pointing that out and the contemporariness of uh, the shows today as contemporary living people yes. Um, today and how we're represented in Reservation Dogs and mm -hmm. Dark Winds and Rutherford Falls, which I adored Rutherford Falls. That was so much fun. Well, um, apparently it, they were working on trying toward the, uh, trying to get it picked up by another um, another platform. So we'll see um, what happens. Uh, 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 Alaska Daily is another yeah. one that I'm I'm getting into right now. That's mm -hmm. um, Native written. Uh, it takes place in Alaska. Um, and it centers on murdered and missing indigenous women in Alaska, which has the highest rate of mm -hmm. murdered and missing indigenous women. And it's mostly due to um, the extractive industry. Yeah, and the um, least amount of protections under it, Baba. Exactly. Right. Um, and Wind River is another movie that was fairly recent, although it has a white protagonist mm -hmm. um, who saves the day, but it talks <laughs> about extractive industry and murdered and missing indigenous women as well. Um, so that's another fairly recent movie, um, I would say, with a pretty heavy indigenous cast. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm missing some, but, uh, but there, there's a lot of new work out here and it's pretty inspiring. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest struggles with um, being uh, you know, a native playwright is trying to break the stigmatization mm -hmm. that when we tell our stories, you know, to, to um, quote what my 
sisters and, and brother over here have said is we use it with humor. But when others, non-natives tell our stories of our past and what has happened, they romanticize mm. a tragedy instead of letting us see it and letting the people see it for what it really is. Mm. And I think that's the biggest struggle with trying to break through you know, to a non-native audience mm. is when you are when you are presenting them with this raw material, you know, this is what happened to us, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the biggest thing I go off of is, you know, the, the uh, cartoon or story of Pocahontas, mm -hmm. okay? That was a story that was romanticized. It was a tragedy. Mm -hmm. She was one of the very first known victims of murdered and missing indigenous women. Mm -hmm. She was 13 years old, stolen from her family, raped, never to see her family again, and died of smallpox at the age of what, 21, 22? <coughs> after being forced to have, you know, four children mm -hmm. by a man who, who stole her. Yes, they did. Now, this is, this is something that has been romanticized. And I think that's the biggest stigmatization that, or one of the biggest stigmatizations that we have to fight with. Like, you know, absolutely. Th this is something that happens to us and it's not something that just happened in the past. Right now at this very second, at this very moment in time, mm. there is a woman out there who is being, who is being, uh, murdered. There's a woman out there who's being uh, kidnapped, you know, and it happens every second of every day. But it's not made aware of. Thank you. No, watch Daily, uh, Alaska Daily. It's a pretty important film, uh, TV series, and I'm very excited about it. Um, it is that time uh, to wrap up, and I would like, you know, to, uh, to end with a quote. Um, that was brought to my attention Friday night when I was uh, watching Tamantha's play something else. Um, I was sitting with my newfound good friend, uh, Dr. Robin Chandler. And at some point she leans over and she says a quote from Amy Césaire. And she said, this is what I have in my mind. She said, um, quote, art is the only weapon we have against the deafness of history. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to leave you with that quote today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Larissa, for coming in on Zoom. I tried so hard to get her here in person. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here and all of your incredible voices. Thank you. I hope I did all right. <laughs>